Okay, we are now recording. Perfect. Okay, so taking a peek at our agenda for today, uh, our meeting is from two until four. Uh, we are going to have from 2 to 2.30 um, some updates uh, and information about our Running Start Re Residency Waiver, as well as some information from our CTC Link Student Financials team. And then we'll have our departmental uh, dual credit updates from the State Board here. And then from 2.30 to 3.30, we wanted to allow some time for uh, those breakout sessions that we've been doing and then a feedback and large group discussion. So uh, we, we are giving about an hour for that today, uh, just to give you all time to, to talk with each other uh, and um, have that chance and opportunity. Um, and then from 3.30 to 4, we're going to end with OSPI, like I said, uh, Tim McLean, um, the uh, dual credit um, supervisor at OSPI, will join us for updates um, and to talk about um, the bulletin that just came out on Friday and um, a few other things as well. So just wanted to, to provide a brief overview of our day today. Um, all right, and then I'm gonna go to our next slide here and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jamie. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I'm still admitting a few people, but if you wanna go ahead and just watch that. Uh, great to see all of you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I wanted to give you um, an update on our Running Start Residency Waiver. Some of you may know we've been in the process of this. Some of this may be new to you. Um, but we have had a work group between um, ARC, the ARC Council, so our registrars and our running start uh, directors and coordinators to discuss some of the challenges regarding residency, determining residency for our running start students. As you know, that's not something um, we're asking them while they're in high school. They, they are protected and considered a resident um, in the K-12 system, but when they exceed that one point for FTE or take a college, or excuse me, a class below college level, tuition calculates and that's when we're having to go out and get information from students if their um, residency is undetermined. So not only has it been a burden for our uh, registration offices, Ryan Start offices, but it's also been um, difficult and uncomfortable conversations we don't want to be putting our students through either. Um, so we have um, kind of a, a dual plan. Um, the first one is to seek legislative change next year. Um, so we are looking at um, overall dual credit changes in a bill, possibly, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit, but hoping to amend one of the RCWs um, regarding the definition of students and just clarifying that. So when students are in the Running Start program, they're considered a resident. Um, for now, we are working on a technical fix. And so what that means is we put together um, a request that went to our uh, went to our presidents for approval first, and then it went to our state board members. And that was approved in March. And basically it's a waiver to address the differential between resident and non-resident tuition for all running start students at our colleges um, that are enrolling coursework that is, um, basically they're enrolling coursework that's not usually eligible for running start funding. So um, it's gonna address the administrative burden on our colleges and the undue hardship for our running start students. So we're really excited about that. Um, so that's kind of a, the, the first step is, is getting that waiver approved, but then it's how do we do that in the system? Um, and that's where we have Brandon and his team here, team here today to talk about that. We're very excited that it will be really nothing on your end of having to do in the system. Um, his team's already started this process last week. This goes into effect for any student enrolling in summer quarter and on. Um, and I believe Spencer has, um, I don't, I, I can't remember now how many colleges is already on this, but I'm going to let Brandon use the right wording because I'm going to, I'm going to screw that up. But Brandon, if you don't mind just kind of sharing what's happening on the um, behind the scenes with your team and what the colleges need to know. Uh, so, uh, so far it is, uh, has been updated for everyone. And so uh, for the summer term, you should not be seeing non-resident tuition post for running start students. And so uh, if you do, you know, uh, SF support at uh, sbctc.edu is where you would reach out to us. But we went through uh, some testing and the uh, functional adjustment was able to happen uh uh, pretty cleanly uh, for this request. And so we do anticipate uh, for the upcoming academic year after the legislative uh, approval goes through, uh, no really big change after that as well, because uh, according to the waiver and the documentation, um, uh, you know, making sure that the 
uh, non-resident uh, tuition is avoided was paramount. And so that was a an update that Spencer was able to take care of uh, through in the testing environment and then in the production environment uh, uh, over the past couple of days and last week. And so thank you very much, Spencer. And um, yeah, we are very confident with the update. And uh, Spencer is here. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add to it? Hear me all right? I can hear you. All right. All right. A uh, couple things. I heard the term, the dreaded term we've been, uh, if, you, if you're familiar in the, the system beyond running start, the W word, the waiver. <laughs> It's not technically a waiver. So if you are looking for some sort of waiver to come in and hit the accounts, that's not the technical way we went to about doing it. Um, config wise, essentially all of your students are going to calculate as resident students for running start specifically, right? This is a change for running start. So what we've done is we removed any non-resident term fees from your two week calc for, for running start students. So there's not going to be a waiver hitting the account. It's 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 just going to calculate from the get go for your running start students the resident rates for anything that that's appropriate. Um, that that was the big one, right? I I just heard and wanted to clarify. If you're looking for an additional new waiver, you're not going to see that on accounts. The config behind the scenes was changed. Um, yeah, but other than that, everyone is swapped over. Um. I did only get through the Seattle colleges, so WA010 to 064 um, before this weekend's run of 2 calc. For everybody else, you should see, you know, if you've already been calculating for summer, if you go and manually calculate these students, you'll see the flip. Or like Brandon, I, I don't think you mentioned this, uh, the big 2 calc runs are on Sunday. That will handle everyone else if they've already been calc for summer term with un un non-resident rates it'll swap over the next time you calculate those students. And that's, yeah, that's it. That's, that's what I got. Thank you, Spencer, so much. And um, I saw in the, the chat that I might not be speaking loud enough and let me know if I'm not. I We're in our new building trying to not talk too loud, but I Brandon will probably be able to hear me. Um, I can always go into a different room if 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 it's uh, not loud enough for you. So please let me know, Spencer. We had a couple questions. Um, I think I saw Heather's um, hand raise, and then we have something in the chat too. Yes, thank you. Um, so just so that I'm understanding um, how it all works. So even if a student is residency is undetermined in the computer system it's still going to calculate as a as a residency in their for their tuition if they're say in a below college level course or over their their funding limit yep that's exactly right perfect thank you so much yeah and i think i saw uh linda had a question in the chat uh, calculation only works for colleges that have their students do their running start college application uh, Brandon or, or Spencer, but I, I believe it's, it's it's about the student once they're placed in the student group. It's not correct. So that, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. So if they're coded as a SRSR or an SRSL student, they're placed into the running start tuition group, which holds all the running start tuition items. And we've trimmed that group. So in order to get calculated as a running start student in the system, they have to have, like you said, um, either either one of those two student groups. Thank you. Any other questions about the waiver policy or the technical side? Janet, I had another a... question in the chat. Oh, okay. Let's go ahead with the question in the chat and then we'll we'll go back to the hand raise. Yeah, I can just read it. Um, I'm asking if students will still need to update their residency status once they're no longer in the Running Start program. Yes, they'll be considered just one of our traditional students, and they will need to have that updated to ensure their tuition is um, accurately uh, being calculated. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, my question is um, for colleges that might have the SRSL group already preset for additional waiver of fees. Do you anticipate this affecting that at all, the change by attaching the um, underdetermined re um, residency rate, or I'm sorry, it'll be in-state rate at this point, but I just wanted to make sure that's not going to affect 
we shouldn't anticipate any changes in our already pre-set up waiver exactly okay. yeah no you shouldn't and nothing will change the only thing that will change will be the two you know for the appropriate tuition items or fees that would get charged like, like a good example was the below 100 instead mm -hmm. of charging below 100 tuition rates at a non-resident rate it'll go to the resident rate that that basically is the only change so all the config colleges have for their low income waiver students which can get kind of complicated that's remained the same so your mandatory fees lack the same and then you know, the waiver will still come in for those non-resident students or, you know, and charge them as resident and the waiver will apply just as it has before. So shouldn't shouldn't impact that at all. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions regarding the waiver? All right. Well, another round of thank yous to to everybody and Spencer, thank you. I know it's your day off, so thank you for joining us for a little bit to uh, clarify the waiver work. Okay, do we, uh, Stephanie, do you want to take the next one or then, or Brandon regarding the grade 10? Go ahead, Brandon, you, or do you want yeah. me to do it? No, no, uh, we were asked to, to make sure that an additional uh, grade level was added so that you could select grade 10 in uh, in the on the onto the custom page. And so uh, Tamara Allen are, are, went ahead and updated everyone's configuration and in the production and I believe in the PCD environment in this case, you should be able you will see grade 10. And so that is uh, on and available. And so uh, yeah. Request heard and updated. Thank you, Brandon. And just to clarify for everybody, that's because of summer. Since rising juniors are counted now, that summer quarter, um, especially on the K-12 side of the house, is still considered 10th grade. And that FTE calc is connected to their the end of their sophomore year. So if they are going to start with you in that summer, they, they need to be listed as 10th grade just to make sure we're in line with the K-12 side of the house. So just to provide any context there. Questions on that? I have a question. Um, this is not actually with the 10th grade, but related to this screen. This upcoming year is the first year we'll have a sixth year, six year senior, sixth level senior. Um, six, sorry, can't, can't speak. But someone who is after fifth year senior, they're going to join us again. Should we just close them in here as fifth year or can we get a, an additional six year level? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. We could check in with OSPI on that. I mean, like, I think it's more um, an accuracy thing. Um, yeah, yeah, like we don't use that information like on the college side for anything, but if yeah. it's used elsewhere. Yeah, that's a good, I don't know, Stephanie, do you have any thoughts around that at all initial, but we can maybe follow up. I think it's a good idea, um, but yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to also run it by OSPI and maybe talk with Brandon and his team a little bit about that, but we hadn't considered that. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. I hadn't considered it either until this year. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, functionally wise, it, it, it shouldn't be too big of a, a, um, a, a leap to add an, an additional row of data. And so we can... I can add that, but as far as if we're able to, I'll leave that up to you. I actually have a quick question um, about the um, summer RSCVF. So something that I actually just recently encountered this week was um, 10th grade students turning it in. Um, and I've noticed so far that they'll put zero. Um, the high school counselors have been putting zero for like basically allotted FTE. So when we enter the RSCVF into the system, right, should we be adding it as like they can use 10 credits or zero? So I'm, I was just kind of confused about that. There was some confusion on the form. And so I just, I needed to ask the question immediately. <laughs> So that's a good question. Um, you know, 
we don't want them. I mean, I guess, yeah, it, they're, they're maxed out at 10. So we, that's, that's what we would want to be doing. I mean, technically they haven't used any of that FTE. So it's almost like it would be zero, but we would want to make sure that we're capturing a stopping point at 10. So if they are going to do more, they're paying um, tuition for that. Okay. And so I should be asking those high school counselors um, for the 10th grade students to put 10 credits on the form or zero. It states on the form that for um, for up or uprising your for new students for for 10th graders that they don't have to fill in that that information, but that they are eligible for 10 credits. So you, you would just put in this computer system that they're eligible for 10 credits. Okay. Yeah, we don't, you don't have to worry. I mean, really the, the RSEVF is gener uh, created to make sure we're not going over that FTE. That's really where it started. Um, now we use it for a lot of different reasons, as we all know, but for this situation, we know that you don't need to worry about, um, it's just a simple 10. Like they can't do more than that with Running Start. And we also know that they will be eligible for the max of 10, not anything less. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah thank you. Other questions on these things? We will have, OS, like Stephanie mentioned, OSPI later. We've got Brandon and his team for um, this first hour. Um, so I want to make sure we've got any additional questions that might relate back to CTC Link team or what we've already discussed. Um, oh, go ahead, Nora. Yeah, can you explain to me how the summer quarter um, FTEs would work for a fifth level senior. So like, is, is, is it the same as like a 12th grader, like an after exit thing where there have to be 15 or 15 credits away from their associate's degree in order to use it? Well, that, that's some unpacking. <laughs> so it depends. Like, so if, if you're, if you're thinking about the after exit funding, that's different than their, their annual FTE. After exit funding, it, this is the last year. So summer 24, it's done afterwards. Um, so I believe Tim's probably going to do more clarification or reiterate what he did last time on that. So that's the 15, if you're 15 credits away from a degree or you've already maxed out your annual FTE. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking of just a, a senior, um, the other option is if they're not graduating, so they didn't meet their requirements, they could take summer quarter um, and availability for summer will be dependent on what they've already used that prior year. Um, so max of 10, um, but again, that's gonna be dependent on what they already used for their, for their senior year. Does that okay, make sense? Okay, it does, I mean, it, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes we'll get like a fifth level senior who um, is graduating and then, um, I guess the question would be, do we treat them then as a just a 12th grade graduating senior where we would say, hey, if you're 15 credits shy of your associate's degree, you can use this after exit funding for this for this summer for yes. this year. And then it goes away. Yeah. So it was right. just provide the funding for two years. So if it's okay. this summer, yes. OK, but the, it's even the fifth year is the same. I just want to clarify. Right. Correct. Yeah, they wouldn't be able okay. to access that, if, access that if they've already graduated. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Stephanie, correct me if I'm missing anything. <laughs> right on, Jamie. Got it. <laughs> um, any other questions on this page? Okay. Um, any more questions? Before we jump into some of the policy stuff, is there anything else you want to ask Brandon and team on the CTC link side of the house? Amy? Mm -hmm. I um, actually have a question um, for Brandon, and I'm not sure if this question is appropriate for him, but um, what I'm noticing is 
we have um, new students that are coming in for summer and for fall. And um, we, uh, I'm just wondering if there's a way that, that the system, when the new student applies um, as a Running Start student, if there's a way that we can communicate with our students. So what we've been doing is we've been using Remind for the longest time um, to kind of keep students and their families up to date with the process, enrollment process, deadlines, and all of that before fall would start, right? Now, um, we're having students coming in, but, you know, because the application hasn't been processed um, or, or it has, we're having, we're, we're kind of having like a hard time trying to reach out to our new families and new students about like what the communication looks like moving forward. And I'm just wondering if there's a way that it's easy for us to communicate with new students as soon as they apply using CTC Link. Because basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to get away from Remind and we're trying to use SignalVine within CTC Link um, and SignalVine uses all the information from CTC Link. Um, but I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can, as soon as the students submit an application that we can start like being able in CTC Link to find that information so we can communicate with our students, if that makes any sense. Yeah, Brandon, I don't, so, um probably different team. I don't know if Brandon has anything else. I have some thoughts and then I'd probably also um, ask Stephanie her thoughts too. You know, I I do agree that once the student group and the SRSR, SRSL is applied, that's when it kind of comes into the, our little custom page that we manage on the SF teams to make sure that everything ends up proper on the student account. And uh, as far as the ability for CTC links um, communications and there's uh, there, it's a pretty vast uh, a, a, a set of abilities that are built in um, after the student has that ID number that can be taken advantage of um, that the communications piece would be you know there's there's a, a, a my uh, uh, partner, uh, Kirsten uh, Catlin, is the the core, uh, you know, uh, associate director for CTC Link. And so if you would be interested, you know, I would say maybe a CT, a, uh, either additional discussion, maybe during this afternoon to see if that could garner the support for a possible enhancement request that would be uh, given to the IT area where we would start to really uh, uh, take apart what's necessary and see what could be set up for you. That could be one route to go um, for sure. I know that we're still kind of in the, uh, I would like to be further along with communications than we are already. Um, but there is a lot of uh, positive that could, that can come out of uh, the configuration for sure. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Um, right now, we're just, we have to wait on our ad, uh, registration team to process their application. And um, we are a very, you know, small school and uh, they are down by many people. So it's really slowing down, you know, the domino effect of getting students enrolled on time. But I appreciate your response. Thank you. And Maria Christina, I don't know, like, so when we're looking at OAAP, you know, I know that there is a step in that, right? It doesn't, that is one thing. And then we have to get the information from that into CTC link. So I don't know if there is an opportunity to work. Um, I think some of this could be maybe the local level, but understanding if you're down staff, that, that makes it harder. But, you know, I don't know if, if your team can have access to the OAAP. And I know it doesn't always catch everybody if they don't fill it out right. I get that, like if they fill out the wrong app. But could you have access to seeing who's, who's applying and getting contact information that way as a starting point until maybe there's something better we can do once you get into CTC Link? thoughts, but you know, I know, I know that can be tough. Yeah. And, and so that's what we're doing right now. We're collecting information from new students that are coming in and we put it in an Excel sheet so we get their email, their phone number. 
but that means that we have to enter that into the email system, um, you know, all emails, and we have over, you know, 400 new students um, coming in. So it's it's a lot of tedious manual work. And I was just wondering if there was just an easier way where we could, uh, as soon as the student applies, that we could just immediately get that information so we can start communicating with them. I mean, there's, I that, oh, go ahead. There's a query that I run that for for RS applicants from once they applied um, from as the- soon, As soon as they apply though? I I believe so because sometimes I've I've noticed that they haven't like been matriculated yet. Okay. Okay, I'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll see if I can find the query and, and put it in the in the chat here. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Okay, any other questions for Brandon and team before we move up to the next to the next step? Okay. Well, Brandon, feel free to stick around or not stick around. We know you're busy. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you all. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Um, and let us know whatever you need. We'll, we'll work with you as always. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. Um, I want to share a little bit about, um, we just got out of the 2024 legislative session, but the big um, budget session is next year. Um, and we, uh, you probably heard um, some concerns we have around college and the high school and some changes we want to make. Also, our current technical education dual credit, CTE dual credit, and then we have Running Start. So what we're trying to do is um, we're working with, uh, gosh, I think it's eight or nine different colleges. We have different reps um, ranging from VP level to director level. Um, that support each one of these programs or a combo of programs. And um, Bill Belden from Workforce, um, myself, Stephanie, and Kimberly um, Ingram from Workforce have been meeting to kind of gather um, uh, what's missing, what's needed in, um, in, in policy and really thinking it, have it a little differently of like, what do we wanna see our students' outcome? What do we want, at the end of the day, what do we want our students to be doing? And what's missing in legislation, but what's also missing on the funding side of the house? Um, and so we have got some great feedback. We've put together some themes of what we're trying to do. And right now our executive director has been, um, and our legislative director has been meeting with Chris Richtel at OSPI to talk about how we can partner with K-12 on this next year and what that might look like. Uh, so I just want you to know it, we're in the very beginning of this and I believe it's probably gonna be like a, a it's a, a big bill that addresses all of it. Um, and we'll keep you all informed and, and always appreciate anybody that want, is interested in being part of that work or providing feedback as we move forward. But just want you to know that we're trying to address funding issues in all of these programs um technical issues with just some stuff in legislation and then some bigger issues that we really want to fix just on the policy side of the house so that's going and we'll continue to keep you updated nothing really we're sharing out right now because nothing is official and we haven't agreed upon yet but that's kind of where we're at um but I'll, I'll leave it just with that for a second to see if there's questions um i know it may still be a little vague but just want to make sure you all kind of know what's going on on the agency side Yeah, Katie, that's what we're looking at. It's called an omnibus bill. Like, so basically it's like the big, the bills that have more than one a program attached to it. So um, with a big focus on CTE dual credit, right now that program, um, uh, it's kind of the wild, wild west at each institution. There's not a lot of policy with it and there's not really any funding associated with it either. So really trying to make some changes with that too. Um, so yeah. Um, but looking at all three and, and hoping to put something together. And once we get closer to having some drafts and what we want to actually try to make happen, we'll, we'll make sure we get that all to you so you know what's going on. Questions on that? I didn't, Stephanie, did you see anything in the chat? I don't see anything yet, but I did also just want to mention, I appreciate everybody that partook on the March 
oh boy, what was that? March 20th, <laughs> the last session, our third installment of this series session, because I know in our breakout rooms, we were taught, one of the things we asked was like, hey, if you could change something about Running Start or all of dual credit, let us know. And so we did take those notes and share it with, um, during the task force. Um, so that was shared and, and part of that. So I just wanted to, to make that note. Um, thank you. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to move down to the second one. Um, wanted to give you an, um, kind of an update with, uh, with house bill 1835. So not sure how many people know about this. This is a pilot, um, that, um, started, gosh, it's almost been two years ago, where um, outreach specialists are placed into the high schools to help students complete their financial aid. And really as about one step before they enroll um, at a college. And that's been happening um, on the Olymp Olympic Peninsula. And then we've been working with like Big Bend and uh, Columbia Basin College. It's been extended to ESU 113, which is our capital region. So that includes Grays Harbor, Centralia College, and uh, South Puget Sound Community College. And um, we are partnering really close with Student Services, specifically with Yokiko that's been doing all things financial aid um, to expand that. So um, we'll be looking at putting outreach specialists into those high schools. And just wanted to keep you um, kind of informed because that does play a part when we're working on K-12 partnerships and also exposing students and getting them to understand programs and opportunities, even in the dual credit space. So. Um, we are in the midst of getting that going for the 2024 academic year. And then I'm going to let Stephanie uh, give you all an update on what's going on with our math placement grant. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, so we had, uh, so let me back up a little bit. So I know that I share this out pretty much every time, but I wanted to make sure if, if there's any new folks in the room. Um, so we have a College Spark uh, grant uh, funded for math placement. And so we're calling it our math placement project. Um, and so we kicked things off in the fall of 2023 at Wenatchee Valley College. And uh, one of the goals was to create a high school transcript placement policy, and we're calling it a grid. And so um, really a lot of our work this year has been creating that grid, getting feedback from folks um, at all the colleges. Um, and uh, at our first convening, we had 21 colleges involved in the work. And uh, we had a virtual convening in January. And then just last week at Tacoma Community College, and I see some folks in the room, virtual room here that were there. So good to see you all this week. Um, we had our, at Tacoma Community College, we had our uh, second in-person convening. Um, and we are at a place now where we have pilot colleges on board um, and we are going to start implementing the high school transcript placement grid uh, starting basically now. Um, and so that's really exciting. Um, and one of the other goals really is to start just bringing uh, our community of colleges uh, together system-wide to talk about placement as we're focusing on math right now, but we do hope to expand the work into English as we continue on and, and kind of bring in guided directed self-placement to this work as well, because we know that over half of our community technical colleges are implementing guided directed self-placement. And so, um, you know, it's really exciting work. We've had lots of wonderful conversations, uh, a lot of people in the room and partaking in this work. And so um, one of the things I just wanted to mention is it's not too late to join as a pilot college. So if you are interested in the work at all, high school transcript placement policy, getting on board, um, please feel free to, to email me. I can share any information out with you all. Um, but we're really, really trying to look at being equitable for students. So if a student is going to, you know, one college, they can get placed the same as a, a college down the street, really. So really trying to, you know, break down barriers for students and um, come together as a, as a system. So, um, yeah, that's that's basically the gist of it. We're looking for an in-person convening um, uh, come fall uh, as kind of a, a next step. And so, um, again, Please, if you want any more information, feel free to, to email me. Let me back up. Any questions before we jump into to breakout sessions? Uh, Katie had a question for you about oh. look, accessing the grid. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I will, during breakout sessions, I will pull up our, we actually have a webpage. Thank you, Katie. And I will share that with everybody. Um, 
before we end today. Um, but yes, we have a, a web page with um, the grid is already on there and then our placement guidance. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> um, so I will make sure to track that down and get that for you all um, during our breakout sessions. Okay, any other questions? All right, great. Okay, so we are at the point where we're gonna do our breakout sessions. Um, and so, you know, Jamie and I were trying to kind of figure out what to, to prompt everybody with. And um, I think the big thing is when looking into next year, as we think about these breakout sessions we're about to go into, um, you know, we would like to continue on the series that we've been doing monthly. Uh, we're curious about topic areas that you all might want us to address or even the formatting, right, of these series. Um, is this working for everyone? We just like some 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 feedback, um, you know, because this is all about bringing folks together and making sure, you know, we're being clear in our communication and, and everything's fluid for everyone. Uh, what would you like to see from us? What would you like to see from these series? Um, monthly, you know, really no, you know, we, we just want some information from you all. So please feel free to take the time in breakout today to think about that. Um, you know, and then any other topics you'd like to discuss, we kind of wanted to leave this open ended just for a chance to everybody to connect in their breakout um, room. And then what we will do is we'll have some time uh, to have, you know, feedback as an entire group. Hopefully everyone had some wonderful discussions. Um, I just wanted to real quick just mention uh, while you all were uh, in your breakout rooms, I did put in the chat the um, Math Placement Project Grant webpage. And then just a little disclaimer, something I forgot to mention, um, which is very important. Um, the grid can be used for Running Start students. So um, it would be, and, and we can also customize it with you all if you were to consider using it at your college. So take a look if you'd like. Um, I just wanted to make sure to give that little disclaimer on that piece. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into our our discussion. Though I'm really looking forward to to hearing what folks have um have learned and talked about. Um, oh, one second, I saw some. Oh, I'm sorry. For some reason, I thought you could. Okay, my bad. Well, let me repost that for everybody here. All right. Thank you for letting me know that. So while she's doing that, do you all want to share? Or I'm also I popped into a couple, and I'm happy to share what what I heard. Um, maybe That's I could start there to get the conversation going. Um, so it sounded like overall um, feedback around these meetings is they've been really um, helpful. People have enjoyed the monthly piece. Um, some feedback uh, in one of our group or one of the groups was possible a little bit more informal so where people can come with maybe a couple questions that they really want to like pick people's brains about whether it's an FAQ policy best practices etc just like hey we're doing it this way what are you doing type of thing so some of those informal conversations that maybe these breakout sessions don't always set up to do as much um, there was also possible connecting colleges based on size demographics region, getting colleges together that might be a little bit more similar to talk about what you're doing and how you're engaging with the high schools. Um, so that was, those were a couple of the questions or feedback, some of the, ah, I can't talk anymore, sorry. Feedback that came out of the two I sat in on. What else? Katie. Hi. We had a very robust conversation, started with everyone, was very much enjoying the meeting, so thank you. Um, we wanted, we have all appreciated the meetings that had specific agenda items, so there was a call out in March to like send your CTC link folks to that one. Um, so everyone on our call attends every meeting, but has teammates who will only attend some, so that would helpful. Wanted to know if we could consider an annual meeting with OSPI and high school counselors, maybe kind of a culture building, getting everyone on the same page that doing the same work, identifying kind of who does what and what, who's responsible for what. Um, topics that we wanted to hear more about, um, kind of advising retention items for next year and I love the idea that you mentioned, Jamie, that someone mentioned about 
bringing kind of a problem of practice and maybe even doing a protocol in a small group to like get uh, solutions from folks you don't talk to always. That sounds really great. Tessa, Trisa, anything I missed? Cool. Thank you, Katie. One thing um, I did want to mention that I mentioned one of the groups, um, we, some of you know about Wisher, the Washington Council for High School College Relations. Um, it is a council. We also have board members and SBCTC is on the board for that. Um, and most people know of it for like the fall council workshops, college planning day, transfer days. But why I mentioned that is that it houses everybody that needs to be involved in this work. So it is private, public, K-12 agencies, um, our two-year, four-year, et cetera. And they, you, they were the ones that tried to do a conference back in 2020 before everything went down. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, we were three weeks. I think I just started my job. It was like four weeks out before it was supposed to go. And they had to cancel it. Um, now, I think a big conference is, uh, I don't know if we're there right now, but we were talking about um, offering maybe three meetings a year, maybe one online, two in Two in person in different parts of the the state where we're bringing our k-12 our university partners and our ctc's together um the, the i think some of the questions we have is do we talk about all dual credit because it's not just running start we're getting the need from college and high school and cte dual credit do we have different breakouts for the certain areas some people are responsible for all three programs at your institution. So those are some things I'd love to get feedback on too, but I do think I'm hearing the theme of we definitely need to get K-12 partners on board with us, but then the other piece that came up was it's hard to get them in person. They're already understaffed. So trying to find that balance, but I think if we provided the space, we would get some counselors that would be very interested in it, so. Others? Um, hello, this is Victoria from Green River College. Um, I'm reporting back for group four. Um, things that we talk, oh, uh, for high school counselors, getting them to come st to stuff, we found that offering food really helps, so, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, uh, um, things that we discussed that, to bring back to the group were, um, the reports used for summer running start to give to the high schools, um, if we could maybe be offering the same form so that high, uh, high schools need the same information. So it, they shouldn't be needing different forms um, from CTC link reports. So just like consistency there would be nice. Um, maybe comparison, comparing advising structures, because um, here at Green River we have dedicated running start staff, um, but not every, college has that, like what does and doesn't work about that, what can help people. Um, and then, because um, uh, some colleges are also incorporating guided pathways. And so we'd like to get like some feedback about how that's changing their advising. And then lastly, um, just maybe more guidance about how fee waiver and book loan funds are being used, because we'd like it to be as flexible as possible for students when it feels like a very rigid thing sometimes. Um, but yeah, we just want it to be as helpful for our students as possible. Thank you. Others? Yeah, it sounds like we're we're all having pretty much the, the same type of, of conversations in these breakout rooms. Um, in ours, we talked about, um, you know, some of the, you know, have times for best practices and, and having it broken out between, um, you know, the size of the college or the size of their, their program, um, you know, kind of what's working, what's not. Um, we also talked about, um, you know, how how we can also possibly get the 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 college to to understand how you know the programs are are understaffed, um, especially when they want us to to be 
you know, have our enrollments up and yet not giving us the support that we need to to properly help the students and and bring in more students um, with the staff that we have. So um, that was an issue, you know, how, what are strategies that we can can use to to kind of help facilitate that. Um, we also talked about the the textbooks and 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 fees and how those are issues uh, and, and barriers to students um, and how sometimes it's it's going to be a choice between college and the high school uh, versus running start um, or CTE type credits. All great stuff. Thank you, Heather. Anyone else? Well, Jamie, there's a there's a comment in the chat from Katie. Um, is there still talk of having a dual credit council? For example, my college is talking through our next customer relationship management CRM and WCC staff are giving feedback through their councils. Mm, that's a great question. Um, this has been like a question for a long time at the agency about where does dual credit live because it lives in both the student services side of the house and instruction. Um, we have brought this up to the instruction commission about what could a dual credit council look like ensuring that all the players at the, are at the table. So we're hoping to keep having this conversation and get some feedback from our VPs and presidents on what that could look like. I think um, we, I, I mean, per, maybe Stephanie and I are biased. I think there should be one. I think there should have been one for a long time because we're, um, when it's official, colleges are more um, opt to pay your dues, send you to things. Um, there are deliverables when you're official counsel, a work plan that you're held accountable to. Um, and so um, I, I think that that's what we need moving forward. So we, we're working it on the agency side of the house, but any support at the college side to do that, I would reach out to your VPs and ask if that's something that, what they're thinking about and are they taking that up to WISC and IC? Stephanie, is there anything else before Tim gets on that we want to share with them, or do we want to switch up the agenda at all while we're waiting for him? Is it mostly just him now? I can't remember now on the slide deck. Yeah, Tim. Tim's on deck uh, next. Um, no pressure, Tim. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess just a real quick update. I, I could provide a couple things. Um, so Brandon Reed and team, student financials team, we are working on the P two two three. Uh, getting that functionality in CTC link. And I know, so I didn't want anybody to think we we haven't been working on that. We just aren't quite ready. Uh, it, it's kind of, um, we're working behind the scenes and Brandon's team is working behind the scenes on, on trying to uh, get something a little bit more functional for folks when it comes to the running start billing report. So that is something that's, <laughs> yeah, celebration in the chat. Yeah, for sure. So um, definitely working on it. It's definitely, um, something that we've got Emily on the student financials team working with us on. So, um, stay tuned for more information on that one. We, we just weren't quite ready to, to announce anything just yet with that. Um, and I'm trying to think, um, we do still, you know, what comes back to the student financials team, uh, we are still talking about, uh, figuring out how to indicate in that student running start page uh, that students are attending more than one college. So that is an ongoing conversation that we're having right now as well. Uh, again, we just weren't quite to a solution yet on that. So that's why we haven't, um, you know, moved forward with that piece yet. Um, and then we're still having conversations about the counselor um, the counselor, counselor functionality, high school counselor functionality on the student running start page as well. So um, I guess what we could do is just any any further comments on anything in terms of student financials or those top those three topics uh, that anybody would like to share out or advocate strongly for um, because we we didn't quite give space for that earlier today. I actually have a quick question kind of related to what you just said um, with the situation that just 
recently popped up for me um, during the billing period for a school. I had a student who's enrolled at two colleges and um, submitted the report based off of what was on the Running Start verification form. Everything up to, to my knowledge was correct. And then the high school is now coming back to me saying that they, um, the student was overclaimed on FTE. Um, I'm not sure where the onus goes to. For, is it the, the high school would have to kind of be responsible for that FTE overage, would, um, which the priority college would need to decrease. I've read in Running Start FAQs where it seems like it would be the high school would have to be on the responsible party for that, but I'm not entirely sure where um, to find guidance for the situation because it's only happened to me twice. And I usually, it works out like the student dropped a class and I'm like, okay, well, we'll just adjust things manually. But now I'm like, well, no, the students enrolled at a full-time schedule and um, I already reported them for a full FTE amount. So we need to figure out where what happens. I don't really know what happens on their end, what they'll have to do at the high schools. Yeah, that's a really good question. Do you, do you have, um, I might kind of almost wait on Tim on that one. Okay. Um, but what do you, what do you, any thoughts? So, um, I mean, generally when, I mean, the general rule when students go over, there is a responsibility on the student. Um, but I, I missed the first part, Janae, like, how did you find out about that? Like, is it the height? I missed that piece. Oh yeah, no problem. It's um, this, this student in particular was, uh, taking 15 credits at our high school and you know we claim them for a one FTE um, and it wasn't until about a few days later after I submitted the enrollment report the high school notified me that hey that we the students over FTE they're they're over claimed um, so the student was well within their rights on what was put on the running start verification form they were told to take 15 credits student took 15 credits um, and we only billed, or not billed, sorry, we reported, you know, 15 credits, everything that was right. And then it wasn't until afterwards that the high school was coming back saying, hey, the students enrolled at another um, college. They're also oh. taking a class here at our high school. They're over their FTE. And so I don't, when it comes to claiming, and I'm very, I'm not very knowledgeable of this piece. I'm not sure if the high school would just have to then claim less. Yeah, that is my guess. But let me, um, I see what you're saying now. Sorry, I missed that first piece of it. Um, I, I, I would, I think uh, it's so situational, but I mm -hmm. think you probably want to check in with Becky mm -hmm. on this piece of it and the high school's, res their, their responsibility of tracking the student um, and what her recommendation is and probably connect with Tim too. I okay. don't know if there's probably like an overall answer for that one. It gets, it gets a little messy. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank That's you. Really good question. And, and Tim actually just jumped on. Yay, Tim. <laughs> we have questions for you already. <laughs> Can you hear us okay? I got you. Uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, we were just, uh, yeah, we were just kind of starting to, to um, transition into your slides and presentation. And so um, we were getting some questions just about whose responsibility it is, right, for um, if you have a student uh, going to two colleges. And I see Jane Berry also kind of put a, a follow-up comment there too. Um, taking multiple classes, it's just not very clear um, like whose responsibility is. I mean, I mean, historically, as I understand it from Becky, I, I thought we responded to one of these questions in, in the listserv. It has historically been the college's responsibility. Um, that can be a conversation for our, um, I, I saw the, the reference in the chat to the RSEBF. I mean, that's something we can certainly dive into as we get into um, our subcommittee about the RSEBF between the, the sectors. Um, but yeah, my, my understanding is the colleges know their FTE better than the high schools. It's not until after reporting that the high schools um, receive the college FTE. And so it, it has, I think, at least from what I've understood from Becky, been the responsibility of the colleges to determine how that gets divvied up. And we could touch base and, and re-talk about this later at the end, just for sake of time, but thank you, appreciate it. Okay. 
Okay, and then I just didn't want to, uh, before we go to Tim, um, I didn't want to miss, uh, Nell had a comment or a question. We previously received guidance about the 910 waiver since it is no longer in place with the new FTE limit. Are there any updates on this? And Jamie, I'm trying to remember, I don't believe so. Just that it, 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 it's not applicable anymore with the up, with the 1.4. The waiver was a state board waiver approved. Um, the president had noticed that a lot of students weren't able to take two classes at the college um, with, uh, what was it, three classes at the high school? Basically, it was, if they were taken enough at the high school, they were at that weird nine credit thing. And they're basically saying these students are missing out on a potential full five credit class because of the nine credit barrier. And so the colleges all agree that they would weigh that the students would have more access to 10 credits while still maintaining the load they want at the high school. But now that we're at that 1.4, that 10 credit, it's, 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 it's not a problem. I mean, you could still find a problem if you wanted to, but generally you're not finding the same problem that we were before when students are really wanting to do a mix of the high school and the college. They can do that now with the 1.4 and the 1.2 was really challenging. If that, I'm hoping that answers it. So the, basically guess, we're not using that waiver. Yeah, what I guess I should clarify, what I'm asking about is the CTC link student running start screen updating the amount of credits paid behind the scenes portion. So um, there was a meeting and we were shown how we can update a student's screen so that the 910 waiver doesn't automatically get applied to their account because the 910 waiver still was active in CTC link. So it was still automatically yeah. waiving that 10th credit. So we are having to manually, manually override do that. that for each gotcha. individual student and monitor for that on a regular yeah. basis. So yeah. I'm wondering if there's updates either to add the, the 910 waiver back into the process or to remove it from CTC link. So the yeah, reason it wasn't removed. Clarified. No, 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 that's fine. Um, it wasn't removed because it was an enhancement request. And when we get those enhancement requests, it's it's not an easy thing to ever have to go back to. And so with all legislative changes <laughs> related to running start, we just we agreed with CTC Link team we would pause and not remove it until we felt very confident that things weren't going to change. Now that's always hard to say, but I um I will check in with them. I would still be a little hesitant. I don't know. I, I would like to get through this next session first before we did anything about it, just to to make sure we feel like we're finally in like a, um, I don't know, some consistency regarding the FTE. Um, but let me let me check in with them and see what, you know, what really are the ramifications if for some reason we had to go back to that, um, what that would do. I think that was the biggest concern is if, what if the legislature is like, hey, we're not a big fan of that 1.4 anymore, we're gonna go back. Um, and then we got, we removed that, what that does to the system and the cost and putting that back in there. So that's kind of why we were holding off on that. Um, I'll check in with them, but I would also kind of like to request that we would get through this big session next year before we, we made a determination where we had a couple years to say, okay, we feel pretty confident that this is what it's gonna look like moving forward. Got it, that makes total yeah, sense. Thank you for asking though, yeah. I appreciate that. I, for, I totally forgot about that piece, so thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Tim, I think we're going to go ahead and turn it on over to you. Thank you for being here uh, this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, go on ahead. Take the stage. Yeah, well, pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I am really, really excited to announce that finally we have the Summer Running Start Bulletin. It almost feels like old news <laughs> at this point um, because of the number of conversations that we've had and the times I've been invited in, into this space. You'll find a lot of it um, redundant with respect to what we've already presented um, throughout this series, but it is out there and it is in print. Uh, so it's a great reference point. Um, I hope that you'll take the opportunity to take a look at it. Um, some of you, I know I may have even sent it out to the listserv. Um, I provided that chart that has all of the various types um, of student, eligible students kind of broken down by funding stream, um, along with limitations and things like that. That's all in the bulletin. Um, as well as some of the procedures in each one of those forms. Um, we 
got the cart out ahead of the of the horse with uh, all the forms that just needed to be released um, for as long as it was taking to get the bulletin approved. Um, so all of those forms you've seen previously, they're included uh, with links in the bulletin. So it's a really helpful resource for you. Um, and that that's that. <laughs> and I and I will be the first to apologize for the length of time it took to get that out. Um, we really did have it pretty well baked in February, and um, the legislative session tweaked the smallest item that spun it out and put it back into the approvals queue again and again and again. Uh, so it is now there, <laughs> and hopefully I can uh, stop wringing my hands over it. Um, so next slide. Um, takes us to one of the things that is addressed in the bulletin, albeit briefly. Um, it is something that we've discussed routinely in these meetings um, since the legislative session ended, and that is the summer running start rate. Um, it was uh, increased to 130% per count. Um, we fully acknowledge and realize that that is not the 150% that it would take to make the system whole. Um, we did advocate for that, um, and it wasn't our decision to make. It's not our funding to play with or do differently with it. it in fact, it's actually a um, proviso, so it's not even connected to the caseload um, that we manage for Running Start. It's a very finite amount of funding that we simply hope we will um, stay within, um, but in any case, for those two count dates, um, the running start rate will be uh, elevated to 130%. Um, it will follow the traditional apportionment process. We're not doing anything differently to process that additional funding. Um, the only distinction that needs to be made, uh, and we've communicated this out to districts in several settings, is that the additional 30% that the legislature has provided for this purpose will come under a separate revenue code. And that revenue code is 310010. Um, and so that's there on the screen. Um, for your billing purposes, I don't think that matters unless you get pushback from the districts asking where this extra money is. Um, again, we've told them and we are holding our own um, sessions sort of like this for counselors and districts and schools. Um, so we're trying to communicate this in a variety of ways, um, but that funding is there. It's just under a different code. And the after exit rates also apply the 130% factor. Um, although, as you know from last year, that's a one count or at least a one payment upon submission of names and enrollment. The other thing that the legislature did to send us upside down and topsy-turvy was to change the 23-24 rates mid-year. Um, many of you know that this came down um, out of the legislative session. And so we are doing our best to respond to that. Becky whipped up a, a tool to help calculate that um, within days, if not hours of, of learning that this was occurring. Um, the updated rates for both next year and the current year in which we're in are there on the screen. Um, those rates do apply retroactively to all quarters. Um, so if you have underbilled, which I presume you have for all this time, um, it is within your purview to go back and recover those funds. And this was communicated to district business officers on March 27th. Um, so that information is available to them. What I will say is it may still be slow to trickle down. Your counselors might not have this information at hand, your school principals and some other district officers may not, but if you have, if you encounter any pushback, um, it, it should be very widely um, known among business officers. So that's the folks that you want to point them to if they have questions about this. You're also welcome to send them the slide deck here with the link embedded in it. Um, it is expected that colleges would connect with, with sending districts to determine 
how to make this work. Uh, this was a surprise to us as well as you. So nobody was exactly prepared to make this kind of accounting change. Um, but for your benefit, the formula um, that would be used to calculate the difference is there on the screen. And as I said, Becky whipped up a calculator tool in Excel that's available from that link. Uh, that should simply make the process a little more efficient. Um, but it's not easy for any of us. It's certainly not easy on the business, uh, the district business officers that are going to have to do this accounting. And uh, also, as you know, from the listserv, the RSEVF for next year is out. I sort of alluded to this um, previously. We made a, a decision this year to stick with the RSEVF uh, that we have most recently updated this spring um, to give us some time to really digest and process what's happened in the last Legis last, last two legislative sessions. Um, we didn't want to upset the apple cart and present yet another new form or revised form. Um, we felt like we incorporated the necessary changes that came out of 1316 and last session um, and wanted to provide some continuity for the year ahead, especially with everybody's anxiety about getting those forms in students' hands and getting the process rolling right now. Um, the commitment are on our end, recognizing that there are folks out there who want to see things different, who want who have proposed changes to us. Um, we have kept a file of those proposals, um, but we really found that there was a need for us to have a more um, routine review process. And so our commitment for um, having adopted the RSEVF as is for one more year was to establish a more routine review process, and that's on the screen. Um, as early as this May, we'll get together um, across sectors to talk about a work group. Um, we'll look at some of the things that we'd like to have changed. We've already spent some time talking about those. We have already investigated some electronic alternatives and platforms that would do this work um, more efficiently. So that that work has been occurring behind the scenes, but we're going to take it on in earnest beginning in May. We will do an annual call for revisions in October until such time as we find a better product or process for this. Um, each fall and winter, the work group will come together to look at the proposals, the things that came um, out of our call for revisions in October, and then we'll have the revisions ready on an annual basis in February so that that syncs up with the registration periods at the district, um, because we understand that the constant tweaking and the, the shifting directions of things um, never make it easy to do work. So we want to just make a more consistent and reliable process going forward. Um, so that being said, the RSEVF is available now. It is not likely subject to change unless something really groundbreaking happened um, outside of our control that we're going to stick with what we have. And as I've mentioned before, we also recorded an RSEVF tutorial um, that should not change as we did not change the RSEVF. That can be a great tool for you. It can also be a great tool for you to share with the schools and districts with whom you work. And the FTE calculator is another tool and the Running Start technical guide I haven't mentioned in a while, um, but we did that coming out of uh, last legislative session with the changes to 1316. We developed that resource too. Um, so that's kind of a package of materials that you could use to um, help the folks that you partner with and, and help your own institutions better understand the running start, our, the RSEVF and the running start enrollment process. Thank you, Tim. Questions for Tim? Oh, is that all that I had? Yeah, that's all. Do you have anything okay. else? <laughs> No, no. My, I, I mean, like I said, we've been doing these um, presentations with our districts and schools, and so I have a, a much longer slide deck. I thought I'd incorporate a couple more of those slides, but a lot of it's redundant because we've talked about them here, and I built those slides off of things that we've talked about before. Yeah, and I did take off the after exit slide just because we've gone through it a couple right. times at this point, like you and I talked about. So, yeah, yeah. questions for Tim. Thank you, Tim. Sure.
Anybody? Yes, Grace. Um, someone put this question in the chat earlier in the meeting, but I'm guessing Tim would be the one to answer it. Um, the question is about the summer EVF form. Um, and for a rising senior that has not participated in Running Start before, so they're a new Running Start student, does that student need to have an FTE calculation or do they not need to do an FTE calculation like an incoming 10th grader rising junior? I think for consistency, it would be irresponsible for me to say they shouldn't. I think they should, they still should have a calculation because they they have been running start eligible before. The distinction is with a 10th grader, they would have never had that eligibility. So for the purposes of, of having checks and balances and for everybody understanding um, that student status, it would be important, I think, to have an FTE calculation even if they hadn't participated before. Because they're still only, yeah, they're still only subject to the FTE that they would have available. And without doing that, I don't know how anybody would know that they hadn't participated before by, by virtue of the form itself. The form does note that a student is new or returning though. Uh, a follow-up question or comment on that is that um because if they are senior they knew but they still already spent some FTE at their high school in their junior year right we still have to calculate how many FTE they already use at high school and how many left for summer so in my opinion they still need to do that FTE calculation to count all of the high school hours or classes of FTE that they have used in their junior year. Yeah, I agree entirely. I mean, if they'd never participated in Running Start before, the likelihood that they wouldn't have FTE available isn't necessarily there, but I think it's a slippery slope if we start deciding which students we're doing calculations for and which ones we're not. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty clear if you're a 10th grader, you don't do the calculation for an obvious reason. But when it comes to juniors and seniors, I think um, if you start saying, well, I did it for this student and not for this student, we could get into some trouble. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, Tim, so much for being here this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the slides. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and wrap everything up if that sounds good. So just a, a quick reminder, um, we have two uh, series left. We have uh, May 22nd, 9-11 and June 11th, 9-11. Um, so I will definitely send out a reminder to the listserv uh, prior to those both of those dates with um, as much information as we have ahead of time for what we will be presenting. Um, and so just uh, keep those uh, uh, on your calendar. And um, yeah, that's that's all we have today. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, really appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, and uh, thank you again, Tim, for for presenting this afternoon. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. We're going to give you, what, 15 minutes back? <laughs>